Right, uh, now I start the meeting. I welcome the Justice Committee's 10th meeting of 2015. I ask everyone to switch off um, mobile phones and other electronic devices. They interfere with broadcasting, even when they're silent. No apologies have been received. Um, decision on taking business in private. I'm asking you to agree to consider item three on our approach to stage one consideration of the FAI sudden deaths, Scotland bill, and item four in our work programme in private. Are you agreed? agreed. We're moving on to human trafficking bill. It's our main evidence session. It's our fourth one. And we have three panels of witnesses. And um, before I start, John, you wanted to clear an interest. And Thank you very much. I welcome our first panel of witnesses, Siobhan Reardon, Programme Director at Amnesty International Scotland, Ewan Page, Parliamentary Affairs Manager at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and Kirsty Thompson from the Legal Services Agency. I thank you all for your written submissions, and we'll go straight to questions. And if you've not been here before, if you just, unless a question is directed at you by one of the members of the committee naming you, if you indicate if you want to answer, just indicate to me and I'll call you. Okay? and your light will come on automatically. It's very efficient in here. Right, questions? John, uh, Jane, and uh, Elaine. John. Uh, thank you. Uh, morning, panel. Uh, th this is mentioned in Amnesty's um, submission, but I would also like the other panel members' view on it, please, and that is about Lord, Advoca Lord Advocate's guidelines in non-prosecution. Um, could you comment on that, please? It should. Oh, yes. Here we go. We yes, go. we'll get into the swing of it. Right. Absolutely. Um, yes, we um, we very much welcome the the intention of the proposed legislation um, to ensure that all offences which constitute human trafficking contained with one act, as well as uh, to to fully support victims of human trafficking. One of um, uh, the issues in our submission, however, is that um, guidance. Um, placing a duty on the Lord Advocate to publish guidance about the prosecution of credible trafficking victims of trafficking victims who have committed offences, we don't think that guidance is strong enough. And we are calling for um, a statutory defence on the face of the bill, so a non-prosecution. Um, sorry. A non-prosecution principle and statutory defence should be included on the face of the bill. Yes, Mr. Page. I, I would agree with um, with Amnesty's comments. I welcome the the uh, provisions in Section Seven uh, around uh, Lord Advocates' guidelines, but um, guidelines are not the same as a uh, don't offer the same um, security as a as a statute of defence. And we know that there are still problems with uh, victims of human trafficking being prosecuted for offences. Uh, that formed part of the, the exploitation they were they were experiencing. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Um, I don't think that they are both necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, my team have worked with um, victims of human trafficking who have unfortunately been caught up in the criminal justice process, and undoubtedly the most effective way to protect them is to get in early and to ensure that the non-prosecution principle applies. The current Lord Advocate has been clear that there is a strong presumption against um, the prosecution of um, credible victims of human trafficking. That doesn't always necessarily filter down to the front line. Um, there is current guidance at the moment, and um, my... Um, what I would say about the bill as it currently stands is it refers to guidelines and it refers to guidelines on prosecution. I would like to see it clearer within the bill what it states in the EU directive about the principle of non-prosecution and the non-application of penalties. Um, I've also raised in another public forum with the Lord Advocate about the status of the guidelines. What does it mean in practice if they're not followed? Um, and I understand that he's taken some of those points on board. Um, there isn't a statutory defence in the legislation which is inconsistent with other um, jurisdictions in the UK. 
Um, my understanding of the statutory defence as it is worded within those other, other jurisdictions is it would actually be quite hard to implement in practice and it is, there's quite a lot of exceptions to it and it does put the burden um, on the victim of human trafficking to establish X, Y and Z. In saying that, um, it would be another, it, to include it within the bill is another level of protection. But in practice, the most effective means of protection in our experience is getting in early and not prosecuting. But you don't get in early. You need something. Absolutely. Yeah. John. Okay. Right. Are you um, back at yes, sir, John? Yes. Y yes. Well, I, I was going to move on to a different um, to well, topic. Well, if it's a supplementary, I've forgotten about my E and B lists. So, is this a supplementary to that? Yeah. Right, Alison. Yes, um, I wonder how the panel responds to paragraph 56 of the policy memorandum to the bill, which um, notes that the introduction of a statutory, statutory defence in this area was rejected because it would place a burden on victims to prov prove the connection between their offending behaviour and their trafficked status, which the government believes would run contrary to a victim-centred approach. Would you like to um, respond to that? Who wants to take that up? Ms Thompson. Um, I think, because again, I think it would be difficult in practice probably um, to, it would put a burden on, on the victim. Um, however, that said, yes. um, it's, it's an additional means of protection for a vulnerable group of individuals. Um, it's, I don't see why we can't have both. Um, and um, I guess it's about how we word it within, within Scotland. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Ms. Reardon. Um, I'd just like to add that um, international law makes it clear that our legal system um, must take adequate steps to ensure that the criminalisation of victims of trafficking does not occur. Um, these are individuals who have been victims of heinous human rights abuses. Their lives have ruined. And then to put them through... Um, into a situation, into a situation where they are then criminalised or deemed, until they can prove otherwise, guilty of criminal behaviour. Um, I think I think it just adds horrific insult to horrific injury, um, and I think that the intention of the legislation to which we are speaking is about a victim-centred approach and ensuring effective and adequate support. I think a presumption. Um, a statutory defence and a presumption of innocence needs to needs to form a very much part of that framework. That's helpful. One final um, follow up: Would you um, anticipate the need for a time limit on the statutory defence? Uh, I think you know, as as Kirsty said, I think that there is a lot of work to be done, and certainly looking at you know the modern slavery bill, um, looking at what's happened in Northern Ireland, we can look at at what amendments, what suggestions we made there. We don't agree entirely with what's happening and, and proposed amendments, particularly with the Modern Slavery Bill. But I think it needs to start from it needs to start from a human rights approach from the victim's point of view. And from there we can look at how it's worded, how it's contextualized, what guidance emanates from that, what policy policy platforms emanate from that. But it has to start from the victim and from a human rights approach from Ms. the victims. Thompson. I just wanted to add that um, from practice, frontline practice in this area. I'm not a criminal defence lawyer. But in trying to implement the non-prosecution principle in practice using the current guidance, there has been a lack of awareness amongst criminal defence solicitors. That's the first point. The second is then a lack of clarity about, well, what is the legal status of that guidance? How do we raise the non-prosecution principle? What you know, how do we do it? Um, what does it matter? They're definitely, when liaising with criminal defence solicitors, something that is a statutory defence or has the equivalence of a statutory defence would seem to, um, would seem just by virtue of that to raise awareness to ensure better application in practice. Margaret, you're on the same point. And, um, I think Police Scotland raised this point, the, the future-proofing of um, criminality and would it be better to have it on the face of the bill to, to, to have a kind of catch-all rather than trying to establish under guidelines what's, what's current now but may not be um, covering what happens in the future? The, uh, 
It's interesting you mentioned the police. Um, one of the legacy forces that we included this in our uh, submission, um, giving evidence to the, the Commission's uh, 2011 inquiry, stated that a clearer definition of what activities or actions might fit within the definition of exploitation would help within legislation, would help agencies. And I think this is the, the real nub, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, that we are dealing with a complex hidden problem where there is a, mm -hmm. a, a systemic problem of lack of awareness uh, uh, on the part of even well-meaning professionals to identify and deal appropriately with people that have experienced a profound human rights abuse. So it doesn't need to be either or, it can be both and, and if there's a way of wording a statutory definition that assists in the overall process, as other people have said, of trying to make, disentangle human tra trafficking victims from the criminal justice system in the first place. Nevertheless, if there, is a if there are additional safeguards there, it can only be a good thing for raising awareness amongst professionals. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 uh, Christian's pulling a face at me as well, which I think means no, you I want to come in with a supplementary on the same point. But before I take you, um, who wants to come in next? Sorry. Somebody else wants to comment. I um, agree right. with what Margaret right. Mitchell has, okay. has said. Um, I don't know if, it, as worded, Section 7 is future. Proof. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Christian. Well, I just wanted to clarify. I think Alison had a very good question on the Police Memorandum uh, 56. You know, is the burden, are you quite happy that the burden will be on the victim to prove a connection between the offending behaviour and traffic status, or you don't believe that there will be a burden on the victims? I think if we just rely on a statutory defence, then, I mean, again, I'm not a criminal defence lawyer, and colleagues will be giving evidence later, but then the burden is on the, the victim to show that they fall within that defence. Um, the principle of non-prosecution takes away that burden um, and ensures that all competent authorities working with that victim have an obligation to ensure that they're identified as such and not prosecuted or not subject to penalties. Just to clarify, statutory defence is not absolute, it's a presumption. It's a presumption that you have been trafficked. Am I correct? Um, it's not an absolute defence, it's, it's a presumption that you've been trafficked, which the Crown has to rebut, surely. In term, again, I would, I would ask my colleagues later on, James. You should be asking that. Roderick, perhaps, but we'll ask the Crown. <laughs> You're not giving evidence. I know you've, you've chastised me. I'll, I'll, I'll get that checked out. John, do you want to come back in? For me, thanks. Um, and again, it's back to the amnesty evidence we've received, Ms Reardon, and it's under the heading Sexual Exploitation and Prostitution, the criminalisation of the purchase of sexual services as a human trafficking reduction measure. Now, as a committee, we've received a great number of, of statements. You might say they're in a pro forma style, um, um, a number of them making strong representations one way uh, in relation to that matter. You conclude by saying there's in, is an insufficient evidence basis for how this, namely um, the criminalisation of the purchasing of sex, redu reduce the demand for human trafficking for ex sexual exploitation in Scotland. Could you expand a bit further on that, please? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Human trafficking and prostitution are two very separate and, and complex issues. Um, our concern, and obviously, you know, we are commenting on something that is not within the bill. We are commenting on something due to many other organisations mooting this for inclusion. Um, our concern is that, yes, human trafficking via sexual, sexual exploitation happens within the gamut or the crime of prostitution. Absolutely. We're not denying that. Um, however, prostitution does not always equal human trafficking. And our concern is by conflating the two within this piece of legislation um, that we are not addressing either of these very complex issues adequately. Uh, the piece of legislation we have before us is about human trafficking. Um, we would very much urge the committee if, if there was... Um, a need if there was um, a, a desire 
to look into reduction of um, sexual exploitation, to look at reduction of prostitution, that that be done on a separate platform with a separate legislative and policy framework that actually addresses the separate issue of prostitution rather than conflating it within a piece of legislation um, on human trafficking. Um, the Convention on Action Against Trafficking Human Beings and the EU Trafficking Directive expressly provides measures to be taken for discouraging and reducing the demand for trafficking victims. And the criminalisation of the purchase of sexual services is not one of the measures they recommend. Um, furthermore, we were very specific with our wording um, when we talked about the lack of an evidence base. Many, many, much discussion has been made around the Sweden model or the Nordic model. Um, that is a very specific legislative response to reducing prostitution within those countries. We need to ensure that we have a clear evidential base that links prostitution and the um, criminalisation of the purchase of sex within a Scottish, within a regional context. And fundamental to that is listening to the stakeholders, listening to the rights holders within prostitution and those organisations that fully represent those voices because... I think, I think what's happened is that we've seen this model being used, um, as I said, in, in, in other countries within Europe, um, and it's quite attractive to take a model that seemingly some have say has worked and implement it in a, in a different context, in a different situation, with the hope that it will also achieve the same ends. What we're saying is that these are two very different issues and need to be addressed through adequate and effective legislative and a policy framework and we don't think that we would do, be doing service to either victims of human trafficking or victims of sexual exploitation prostitution by conflating them within this one piece of legislation. Does anybody else wish to comment on the panel? No? I, I, before, yeah, I've got... Um, Jean, was your question on this or not? I've, I've, I've got supplementaries. I just want to check with Jean. You're something different. So supplementary to this, I, I do understand, yes, I've got Gil and I've got Elaine. Both wanted to come in this particular line of questioning. So in regards to Am Amnesty International, and I see that you've got concerns with regards to the prospect of if we did uh, succumb to criminalisation for the purchase of sexual uh, services, then there's a prospect that uh, you know these uh, people who are engaged in it might not be protected and driven underground. I wonder if you would want to make any comment on that. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of I'll reflect on um, the comments made by the Council of Europe. Um, of experts on action against trafficking human beings, Gretchen, their third general report. And I will paraphrase because it does say that, um, that if this is to be seen, if the, the, the criminalisation of the purchase of sexual service is to be seen as a measure for reducing the demand for sex, therefore sexual exploitation, therefore human trafficking, um, that... They need to ensure that measures taken do not, as you rightly say, drive the victims of trafficking underground, making them much more vulnerable to um, ex further exploitation. Um, looking at criminalisation of the purchase of sexual services on its own without looking at the country context, the regional context, without listening from the rights holders and without looking at um, a wider a huge wealth of welfare um, uh, responses as well, I think would be incredibly detrimental, wouldn't be appropriate for this piece of legislation. And um, I would strongly, an amnesty, as, as we advocated in relation to the Northern Ireland Bill, would strongly advocate that if this is something which is to be viewed and is with it, which is to be taken forward, the Justice Committee itself take on research for that Scotland specific, to, to find out very much a Scotland specific context for this issue. Yeah, further to that, I know that uh, in Scotland, although I, I don't have any evidence to this effect, I've just been told in other areas in the work that I do, that there's some parts of the Scottish community, some ethnic groups are very, very difficult to engage in. And the knowledge that, that uh, was passed to me is that, that there is prostitution taking place in a very, very close society. And I wondered if any of the panel or, or Amnesty International had any evidence uh, of that in particular 
or if there was any evidence to suggest that the fear that people have with regards to driving uh, underground, have you any, is there any evidence uh, that can, can be brought to the table in that regard? Uh, um, I don't have any evidence at this point in time that I can share with the committee. Um, however, I think the assumptions and that, that you've communicated have been anecdotally um, um, communicated in relation to um, the adoption of such a model, of such a legislative response from um, both sort of NGOs, campaigning organisations and rights holders um, within Europe, certainly by the Council of Europe um, Group of Experts on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. They've raised questions about this as well. So whilst I do not have evidence that I can provide at this moment in time, I think anecdotally we've also been hearing the same thing. Take a lead now, um, Elaine, on the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it's just uh, according to an article in Holyrood uh, Online this morning, uh, the Scottish Government says that it is speaking with a range of different <coughs> interested parties and will carefully consider any amendments bringing brought forward relating to the criminalisation of the purchase of sex. So it sounds as if the Scottish Government is giving some consideration to the representations being made to it. Uh, have you been in conversation with the, the Scottish Government about this? And what's your view of those like Tara who believe that if it doesn't happen, and it's happened elsewhere in other parts of the UK, that Scotland will become a sort of soft touch for criminals exploiting women in this way? We have not been in contact specifically on this issue with the Scottish Government. We um, felt that it was something we wanted to raise within this forum first. Um, We've got your priorities right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'd like to think so. We'd like to think so. Um, I think that, as, you know, as, as said earlier, that there have been um, that a model including uh, a sort of a criminal justice approach with the criminalisation of the purchase of sex has been used in other countries and has been discussed. I think we're talking about um, Sweden, Norway, um, Finland, a number of countries that have already implemented something along those lines. And I think to talk about a Swedish model or a Nordic model is a misnomer because it's been a different variation on this on this approach. Um, Canada and the UK, yes, are also talking about this. What we're saying is that, that to look at the criminalisation of the purchase of sexual service on its own as a standalone measure to reduce human trafficking via sexual exploitation, we do not feel that that is adequate and appropriate. Would you prefer to see it standalone legislation if it's considered at all? As I said before, be we, would like, we would like to be... You know, we think that they're very, two very serious... Um, you know, I mean, yeah. very serious issues which really deserve standalone legislative Thank scrutiny you. and Thank policy you. platform. Yes, I think, I think that's absolutely clear. Um, Jean, um, different line, <clears throat> yes? Different topic. Um, I'd like to ask the panel um, whether um, it's about child trafficking victims whether they think that the provisions of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 are sufficient to protect and support child trafficking victims, or should this bill be more explicit? And if you do think this bill should be more explicit, what, in, in what ways should, should it um, be explicit? Now, who wants to take that up? Ms Thompson. <clears throat> Um, I think this bill should be explicit regarding um, the protection of child victims of human trafficking. Um, the key European standards, the EU directive, makes it very clear that children are particularly vulnerable, they have particular characteristics that need particular measures of protection. Um, the EU directive saw fit to, to, to make that clear. Um, I think this bill um, should, should also see fit to make it clear. Um, in terms of ensuring, again, just taking the overarching principles from the EU directive regarding um, the protection and assistance to child victims of human trafficking, yes, the detail and the clarity of that, be that in a strategy, but um, it, um, it's a, a star commission from the, the bill as far as I'm concerned. And Again, we represent child victims of human trafficking across Scotland in our service. And um, there are difficulties in implementation. And a clear, clear statutory principles taken from the EU directive would greatly assist. Anybody else? Yes, Ms. Reardon. Agree, completely. Um, 
I think that... That's uh, enough, if you agree. Oh. <laughs> yes, if you don't need to elaborate, if you agree with everything that's just been said, but don't let me stop you, no, because no, no, no. you've complimented um, if, the if, committee. If on specific issues, we can elaborate, but we completely agree. Jane, do you want us? Yeah, I'd like to uh, use Mr. Page has indicated he wants to say anything. No, I would agree with everything. There you are. You general see, point. We all agree. I wanted to just inquire then about the role of child guardians or advocates. Yep. Um, I visited that project in Glasgow, and it, it seemed to me that they, they were playing a, a very important role. And the bill is not very specific about that either. So I'd like some comments about that if, yep. if you've got them. Ms. Thompson. Um, we work on an almost daily basis with the Scottish Guardianship Service. Undoubtedly, they play an important role in, the, um, in fact, the identification of child victims of human trafficking and indeed ensuring access to support and assistance. Um, I do think their role would be strengthened by having it contained within statute. Um, at the moment, um, they are part of the proceedings by virtue of personalities, effectively, rather than by virtue of them having a right to be notified of certain proceedings, having a right to attend. Um, there is no automatic referral to them, for instance. Um, I think the EU directive is very clear on the requirement for a guardian. The Scottish Guardianship Service at the moment only works with um, separated children. Um, it does not work with all children. Um, in order for us to say that we've transposed this, the EU directive, um, I think we need to be clear on the clarity as to who is a guardian and who is the guardian for all children. And <laughs> I'm not sure that the named person in the Children and Young Persons no. Act does that. Okay, that's very helpful. Right. Anybody else? Do you all agree? Just that's lovely, isn't Thanks it? That makes it. So, 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 I'll take Margaret next. Margaret, because you've not been in. I, I wonder if the panel, particularly uh, Ms. Thompson, and Mr. Page, would comment on their concerns about the definition um, of trafficking and exploitation as currently drafted in the bill. Sure. Um, well, at, at the risk of, um, of repeating points that have already been made. The, there is a virtue in looking again at the requirements the of the EU directive and seeing how effectively these, the proposed transposition of the directive into, into law through this, mm -hmm. the, the, this bill uh, actually is. Specifically um, on the travel, maybe? The travel point, which I know has been well made by yeah. in, in previous evidence sessions and we covered it off in our, in our submission, mm -hmm. but just being absolutely clear, and again, just reiterating my earlier point about Given the, the complexity, complex hidden nature of the crime and given the, the very real problems of low uh, awareness amongst the public in general and professionals that may be coming in contact with traffic people, getting the, the legislation as the primary legislation as clear as possible about what constitutes trafficking and exploitation mm -hmm. can only be a good thing. And that does not mean, I know that there have been worries voiced about if you try to have a a comprehensive definition in law, you have the unintended consequence of it being too rigid and not being able to apply to every situation. But you can have a, you can have a, a non-exhaustive but nevertheless wide-ranging um, definition in the face of the bill that better reflects the, um, the directive um, wording. Would it be your um, contention that it actually doesn't comply with the EU directive as currently drafted? There's a great deal of um, a, a wide margin of applicability in how states uh, transpose directives into, into, into domestic law. I think it would be more about less looking at it as a compliance issue and more as a, a matter of, of best practice and getting the best possible uh, legislative framework in Scotland. Ms Reardon, you were nodding. Um, just to, to say that uh, absolutely, it, you know, it is an issue of best practice rather than compliance. However, the, the directive um, itself does stipulate that when um, states are bringing legislation on it in a domestic context, that they should apply the widest possible um, definition of what a human trafficking is to address yet yeah, in terms of best practice. Ms. Thompson. Um, yes, I, I would echo the comments um, um, of my colleagues uh, this morning. I don't like the use of the word travel as it is inserted. I think it makes the definition too narrow. Um, in thinking of cases that I have, that I've seen, of both British and non-British um, cases of human trafficking, I would be worried that this definition would not apply to all of those cases. 
it takes us to looking at the, the movement first rather than looking at the exploitation and working back from that. So I think in your submission you go a little bit further and say it doesn't comply. I would, <laughs> I would argue, yes, that, um, that it doesn't. It's too, it's too narrow and I would be worried about the consequences of that in practice. Careful, they read your submissions closely. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact there is that variation between the panel members, I think, must be of concern to the committee. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. I'm going to take Roderick, who hasn't been in yet. Roderick. Thank you, convener. Um, morning, panel. I just wanted to move um, discussion on to Section 8 of the Bill, the duty to secure support and assistance. <coughs> and can in invite you to, to let me have your thoughts as to whether you think this section is adequate or whether it could be improved. Who wants to pitch in? Ms Thompson, you look as if you're not the starting block. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, I think it is um, excellent that this bill, which is a criminal justice bill, has taken on board um, the recognition from the EU directive and others that even although it is a criminal justice bill, we require to protect the, the rights of the victims and provide support and assistance. Um, so and then I guess the second point of that is just to make sure that it, that, um, that it does that in the best way possible. Um, we have uh, the current regime in Scotland works on a funding arrangement for adults. Obviously, it doesn't, it doesn't refer to children, which is a gap. Um, and unlike England and Wales, there has been quite a flexible operation of that funding arrangement. Um, it doesn't, it's not tied too closely to the operation of the national referral mechanism. I'm very much of the viewpoint that if someone fits within the definition of a human, uh, definition of a victim of human trafficking as designated in the EU directive, then there is a requirement to provide them with support and assistance, regardless of whether they have been referred into or agreed to be referred into a formal process of identification, like the National Referral Mechanism. So I would be concerned that in putting this on a statutory footing, we've maybe made the current flexible practice a little bit more, more rigid, a bit more aligned to an NRM, and um, also, of course, it doesn't refer to children. I'd just add that I think the, the provisions under Section 8 have to be read against um, the, the policy rather than the legislative work that will be done with the development of a national a, a human trafficking strategy. And there's going to be a, a lot of work there to ensure that... Um, we don't end up, as has been said, with, a, with an overly rigid NRM-focused um, understanding of the, the needs of human trafficking victims, but we have a, a clear sense of how um, trafficking networks are going to be disrupted through a national strategy, but also how the care, support and assistance that's referred to uh, in the, uh, in the um, provisions for the national strategy are best aligned to existing, devolved, national and local um, structures and systems uh, so that there is a and again this gets back to the point of making sure that social workers and professionals from criminal justice agencies and right across the, the public sector in Scotland have the confidence and training to identify a human trafficking victim regardless of whether that person has been through the NRM process. Ms Reardon, do you wish to no yeah, comment? I agree. Mm. Roddy, do you want to come back? Um, I, I just wondered whether anyone had a, a view as to whether or not there should be in the bill some kind of recognition of a minimum standard of support and assistance in some form by regulation or otherwise. Or are you quite happy well, to leave it? I, I, there has been discussion around a trafficking care standard. I think it would yeah. be useful to explore what kinds of things would, yeah. that would cover. But again... Um, Working in, in human rights and equality law and policy, there is an enormous challenge around um, transforming the debate beyond bare compliance to best practice and, and ensuring that, that human rights principles are enacted in, in practical, meaningful ways is, um, is a bit more than compliance to, to, to minimal standards. So it would, be, it would be a challenge in wording that correctly. Okay, and in terms of the, the provisions 
section 31 on the strategy itself. Does anybody have any comment on the um, requirement to prepare a trafficking exploitation strategy and those provisions? It's welcome that the requirement is there in statute. It will be, the proof will be in the, the, the pudding. We'll have to see what comes out of the strategy. But um, proper alignment uh, of a Scottish strategy with existing structures around adult and child protection, different, uh, different provisions in criminal law, uh, um, national outcomes uh, and indicators. The, the policy and legislative environment in Scotland is is very distinctive. So a national strategy cannot be a standalone free-floating entity. For it to have purchase with agencies, particularly at the local level, it will have to be made explicit how this is aligned with, with the other policy and legislative drivers that local authorities, the, the police, uh, health boards and others are working to. Thank you. I have still John Gill and Christian. Give me an idea of the questions so I can put you together if they're similar. John, what's yours on? It, it was simply a, a comment in Amnesty's uh, um, evidence, if you bear with me, please, about an independent and specialist human trafficking commissioner. Fine, that's not. <coughs> yours the same, and uh, Christian. <coughs> On the uh, national referendum. Right. Uh, referendum well, let's go back to the national referral mechanism first, then the Commissioner, because we, that's partly what Roddy's question was about. So if you ask yours first. Yeah, my, my, my two questions on, on both are, are quite similar. On the national referral uh, mechanism, uh, we maybe heard from evidence we took, and people were thinking about having a Scottish model. And I note that uh, in the evidence, recent evidence given by Amnesty International, we talked about it. Uh, do you think this um, idea of a Scottish model, if, if we need a Scottish model, uh, should it be um, in the bill? Should it be in the strategy? Where should it be set? Uh, and, and, and how we should go about it? Um. As set out in our submission, um, we believe that the current national referral mechanism, there are many failings to it. We are not the first to say that. I think that is common, um, the commonality and probably what the committee has heard. Um, and we believe that in order to truly um, address the intention of the bill about a, a properly victim-centred approach um, to trafficking, we believe that examination of the potential of a Scottish model is, is something that we've actually called on the Scottish Government to, to commit to. Um, for the many reasons, for the you know, reasons um, Ewan has outlined in terms of there is a very distinct context in Scotland. We have many different drivers. We have different policy platforms. We have different stakeholders. It is a different environment. We believe that that needs to be taken into account. And simply in, uh, on a question of geography, um, both in terms of um, closeness of geography and also in support services, we believe that having a multi-agency, multidisciplinary um, model for um, identification and supporting um, victims of trafficking, both adults and children, um, would, would and could be delivered very well here in Scotland. So we are very supportive of the examination um, and um, where it sits, I think that has to be looked at in terms of um, where... Uh, I think that that needs to be looked at in terms of um, both the strategy, probably the strategy, but also in... Um, looking at what we want to deliver, how far it wants to go, whether we need to put it on, strategy, on this, um, statutory footing or whether it needs to be something within guidance, we need to be something to progress to and it needs to be as part of a strategy and action plan. I think there is further discussion to be had. But I think the principle and the provision of a Scottish model to identify and support victims of trafficking, I think that is something that we are very supportive of. Mr Page, you're waving your pen. Is that, <laughs> is that an indication of intention to speak? Um... I, I am, it is. A, <laughs> right. I, 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 I suppose the, the, the Commission would approach this less from the question of should there be a separate Scottish NRM than what would a, what would a model of excellence on how an NRM should operate be and are we currently um, anywhere near that? And I think the answer would be a resounding no. Um, to its credit, the, um, the, the Home Office, <laughs> Office Review from November last year recognised the, the many failings of the, the current arrangements uh, and many of these were picked up in the Commission's uh, 2011 inquiry, um, particularly the, the, the obvious glaring conflict of interest 
where you have a, a, an organisation investigating somebody's status as a trafficked human being at the same time as um, considering their, their immigration status. I think, at the very least, um, given that we, um, once uh, the, the dust has settled on the UK election in, in May and uh, the gears start to turn again, we're going to be looking at, at pilots uh, to, to test some of the um, Home Office Review's recommendations. My understanding is at present none of these pilots will be Scotland-based. Uh, an, ov an obvious modest first step, I would have thought, would be to look again at whether that's adequate for our purpose. The, um, the NRM, uh, the Home Office Review, uh, explicitly excluded um, uh, Scotland from its recommendations on trafficked children in, in the recommendations made because it recognised that the, the, the system in Scotland is too distinctive to make broad recommendations that are going to work here. I would argue, I think it was, uh, I think it was yourself, uh, Mr. Allard, who made the point last week about um, a person with mental health problems or learning disabilities a, um, who may be a victim of human trafficking and, and what would happen there. If you were looking in general in Scotland at a person that had mental health problems or a, le or a learning disability and they were in a, a situation of enhanced vulnerability, it's highly likely that that person would be treated as an adult at risk of harm and would immediately be brought into the multi-agency framework that was introduced with the Adult Support and Protection Act in Scotland, which is, a, is not the same policy framework as is being proposed even under the new, um, the new requirements for, for trafficked adults in the, the Home Office review. So I think um, the Home Office is, it was right to recognise that a law and policy around children is too distinctive to make broad recommendations. I would argue that we'd, it would make sense through pilots or through further consideration to look in the round at the, the distinctive policy and legal environment we work to in Scotland. Uh, and from that, that would help give a, a more definitive answer on whether we need a separate Scottish NRM or whether we just need a, an NRM that is better a, able to place the victim at the centre of, it, of its deliberations, but is also alive to the, the complex differences in law and policy across the different UK jurisdictions. Yes, Ms Thompson, do you want to comment? Um, yes, I think, um, I think what I would like to see is a more general duty in Section 8 regarding early identification and appropriate access um, to um, support, again, just taking the principles from the EU Directive and the Council of Europe Convention. So I would maybe even strip out some of the detail that's already there and contain more of the detail about how we, how we ensure that early identification, how we ensure that um, access to support on the ground within, within a strategy or other documentation. Um, just, to, I guess, to, to confirm um, what Ewan has said, from the ground, there it is a, still a lack of understanding about what the NR, NRM is and how it operates, but there is also still a lack of understanding about how each public authority in Scotland has still remains with the responsibility to identify and protect, and how our obligations in terms of victims of human trafficking fit within existing child protection framework, adult protection framework, where do 16 and 17 year olds fit in? So there is still a requirement for clarity as to how um, not only do we early identify, but how we provide support within our existing um, frameworks. Good to, now to move on, because very quickly, John, your question, which was the same as Gill's, I think, that's been covered. Right. Um, Commissioner, it's, it's, uh, we, we have the answer there, but uh, uh, the law enforcement, it will be a law enforcement uh, commissioner, not a, a, a victim centred. So are we, are we thinking the same thing? Should it fit? Should it be in the bill? Should it be uh, uh, in the guidance? Should it be uh, in the strategy? And are we thinking of having a Scottish distinct uh, anti-slavery commissioner? I think the point's well made that the anti-slavery commissioner's focus will be on uh, the criminal justice elements and the disruption of trafficking networks. And that's, that's all to the good. It's a, it's a, it's a, 
I, one of the fundamental recommendations we made in our inquiry. You're right, that, does, that it's not going to cover everything we want to see with the, with the Scottish legislation. So being clear about roles, um, speaking as an employee of a cross-border commission, um, you know, they can work, uh, but you know, it's, it's making sure again that um, even with the, the tighter focus on criminal justice that the Commissioner is properly cognisant of the different uh, legal and policy drivers, different provisions in criminal law and so forth uh, will, be, it will be essential. Um, to that end, um, like I think a, a number of other submissions, we believe that the bill should explicitly state the legal duties and obligations um, of the Commissioner's role as it pertains to Scotland. I think one of the problems comes from um, misunderstanding or ignorance um, of, of different institutions, different aspects of, of, uh, a, devolution, uh, of a devolved administration, um, of devolved institutions. And if we can state it clearly, then at least everybody's on the same page as to what the different roles and responsibilities are. Um, one of the concerns was the, actual, the absolute absence of any reference to the UK um, anti-slavery commissioner within this bill. And so how does the interface work? How does any integration work? Um, and at least if it is stated explicitly on the, on the face of the bill as the legal duties and obligations, there will be some common understanding. Right, that's it. I see nobody indicating and I'm not looking around at anybody. So I'm going to say thank you very much for giving your evidence. I'm suspending for five minutes before we move on to the next panel.
Thank you very much. We're all back, so let's uh, get on to the next session, please. We're along uh, another panel after this, another work to do this morning. I welcome um, our second panel of witnesses, uh, James Wool, QC, Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, James Mulgrew, Member of the Criminal Law Committee and the Law Society of Scotland, a Assistant Chief Constable Malcolm Graham, Police Scotland, and Maura McKinnon, Chair, Child, Scottish Child Protection Committee, Chairs Forum. Before I proceed, Roddy, you want to make a declaration? member of the Faculty of Advocates. Thank you very much. Can I thank you all for your written submissions? I'll go straight to questions. Margaret, John. Yeah. Could I ask the, the panel if they have any um, concerns about the definition, and if so, what are these concerns? And I think you've all been here before, perhaps, so you know that um, if you just indicate you'll be called and your light will come on, microphone will come on automatically. Who wants to take that up? No concerns. Mr Mulgrew, thank you. Well, some concern has been expressed about whether or not the definition complies with the EU directive definition. Um, and the, pa the panel has heard evidence from the previous session about it perhaps is not a question of compliance, but more a question of best practice. And over the course of previous panel sessions, the panel have heard that there are concerns about the use of the word travel in section one, that perhaps the exploitation of victims could be expanded to include other activities. Um, reference has been made to a, perhaps a catch-all provision as well. Um, and also uh, the, the society take on board the fact that this is an opportunity to implement the EU directive in the widest sense and also to perhaps future-proof this particular matter uh, for us far in the future as we can possibly achieve. In your recent submission, you didn't um, raise any concerns about this, and you've said it's your know, interpretation quite widely, but I think there was a specific concern about the use of the word travel, and that it didn't cover travel within um, a country in a rural area from city to city. Yes, well, the, the information that we have obtained from, in particular, Ms Thompson, who gave evidence at the, the earlier session, is, is that the the solicitors who deal with victims of human trafficking, that they often encounter situations where it isn't inter-country trafficking, but it is within a single country and perhaps even from one part of a city to another part. And so it would be better if that particular situation would be covered in the, in the offence. Okay. Mr. Wolfe. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, uh, the, the faculty picked up one or two specific issues in relation to the definition. Um, I have read the previous evidence before the committee and I note the points that have been made about the primary definition. Um, it, it's perhaps worth keeping in mind that one of the purposes of this piece of legislation is to implement um, the obligation to uh, bring the directive into effect in our domestic law. And so it will, I think, be useful to go to the directive as the, um, the legislation which is to be implemented in our law. And um, previous witnesses have noted the difference between the basic definition in Article 2.1 of the directive and the basic definition in the legislation. Now, I've noticed in the policy document the reasons given by the Scottish Government uh, for the approach they've taken. I have to confess I don't at this point have a view on uh, wh whether the differences between the directive and the Act are material and significant and what those significances might be, but it is worth noticing there are differences. Um, and that, that always presents our risk, at least, that uh, we're not fully implementing our obligations. Um, there are two respects in which the, um, the Act um, uh, could be better aligned with the directive. Uh, the first is in relation to the question of consent. Article 2.4 of the directive tells us that consent of a victim to the exploitation shall be irrelevant. Um, and in the Act, consent is dealt with only by reference to 
uh, the arrangement of facilita facilitation of travel. So there seems to be a, a, a failure to reflect accurately the directive there. And then Article 2.5 of the directive tells us uh, uh, specifically that when the conduct referred to in paragraph 1 involves a child, it shall be a punishable offence of trafficking in human beings, even if none of the means set out in paragraph 1 has been used. And these are the threat, use of force, and other forms of coercion. And it's fair to say that in Section 3 of the bill, um, the um, apparent attempt or the attempt to uh, reflect that in Section 3, subsection 8, is, um, if I put it this way, perhaps not the most obvious way <coughs> to uh, give effect uh, specifically to the uh, requirements of Article 2.5. Uh, Thank you. Yes, Ms McKinnon. I think it was just probably just to reiterate the point that's been made in terms of the importance of, um, I think, the word travel in terms of trying to ensure that we um, have a clear definition of, of what we're meaning in terms of trafficking, in terms of, I think, working with children from a child's perspective we have children who are being moved around cities from one area to the other and I think the bill has to strongly emphasize that we have children who are being moved around cities um, on a regular basis and that we we have to ensure that the bill takes account of that. Yeah, I would agree with that uh, although I think it is well defined in the bill I mean I think the the, the definition of travel is quite adequately described and it's uh, it's deliberately broad. Um, Mr. Wolf referred to the, uh, the the sort of policy description intent behind it, which is to to make the definition of trafficking broad, and we would support that without uh, being able to or qualified feeling qualified to offer any comment on whether it's uh, consistent with the the EU directive and, and EU legislation. I think, and this perhaps goes slightly beyond the. Uh, the, the primary definition. I would agree with the point that, and, and this is in our written submission, that we would be very keen uh, to see that uh, the, the issues round about um, forced labour and um, servitude that are dealt with in section four, um, that it's clear there round about consent, that uh, we think it's important that uh, consent um, should not necessarily be an issue, i.e. people might consent to being in these situations um, but we don't think that that should be taken as being, and it should be explicit in, in there that that's not necessarily um, uh, an issue, uh, and it isn't at the moment, and, and we've raised that. Uh, and again, uh, we raised in our written submission that we felt it would be helpful to specifically define the circumstances round about forced criminality, um, which is an issue that's attracted some consideration and debate uh, in, in relation to, for instance, the, the, the statutory defence, which we might come on to later. Um, but we think it would be very helpful if forced criminality or exploitation to commit criminal acts was specifically uh, highlighted as being a form of exploitation, uh, and that would assist us with dealing with that as a, as a live issue. Where would, that, sorry, where would that be put in? Which section? Section uh, I think four. Put it in section three, I think. Section three. Okay. Right. Um, right. John, you are next, followed uh, by Lane. Thank you, Good morning, panel. If I can just follow on on that, um, ACC Graham, um, it, it actually was the area of questioning I was going to ask you. There must be a challenge for Police Scotland. They come upon a scene, <clears throat> if we would understand typically a, a house where drug cultivation has taken place. Can, can you explain the... I mean, you're treating that as a, a crime scene quite appropriately initially. What at the moment takes place that would cause you to identify the individual as a victim of human trafficking? Who, who are you engaging with? And is there anything in the legislation that will make that easier in the future? Or, I mean, I note your comment about the specific insertion of that in the bill. Yeah, so, I, I mean, to cut to the chase, at the moment there isn't anything in the legislation that's going to make that specifically easier in a situation where we feel that the people who are involved um, at a fairly low level in an organised crime group who have been coerced or exploited to find themselves in the position of committing that crime, i.e. Uh, normally acting um, as somebody who is looking after uh, a cannabis cultivation, and there are a myriad of other circumstances, I should add, where people are forced or coerced into criminality who have been trafficked. But in the specific example that you ask about, 
um, then it relies upon uh, the police at the point that the uh, offence is identified. So normally there will be a report or we will proactively identify that there's a cannabis cultivation. Uh, and when we find that, we will then find a number of indicators, signals, which would suggest to us that the individuals that have been involved have potentially been subject to trafficking. Now, in the vast majority of circumstances, when we arrive at safe premises, the individuals aren't present because quite often people don't live uh, or spend long periods of time in the premises. We might do something proactive to try and identify those people. Uh, and in the vast majority of cases, the individuals, if we do identify them, will not identify themselves as having been exploited or um, forced into the work that they're doing, even although we may be able to gather evidence that that has been the case. So the point that I'm making uh, earlier is that it would be helpful to us if when we identify those circumstances that we could demonstrate that we believe somebody has been forced to commit that crime as a specific forms of exploitation, it would be helpful for that to be specified in the Act. And, and can I ask the, the two other issues regarding that? Now, one of them is about the identification of age and the challenge of that and what difference that would make and how you would treat an individual at that point. Mm -hmm. And also the influence of immigration law because we hear that that takes precedence, and we've heard in the previous panel the decision maker having a decision about the well-being of an individual also having responsibility mm -hmm. for, and, and the, the competing tensions that can be there. At what stage would you, for instance, become aware of the immigration authorities expressing an interest? Are you obliged to tell them? Or we, if uh, there was a question over somebody's immigration status, then we would be obliged to uh, tell immigration authorities so that they could... Um, uh, fulfil their role in relation to that, uh, we would uh, do everything that we could to try and work with an individual who had been the victim of a crime to ensure that they were adequately supported within the, uh, the current regime and within the services that are available, uh, and that is very different in different parts of the country. Uh, and as I think you're probably inferring through your question about what difference does it make when you identify the age of the victim, uh, then that will vary from place to place as well, uh, and has been has has been highlighted, and as we highlight in Even our written response. Even within Scotland, ACCB. Sorry. Even within Scotland, once the. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, and that, is that, that in relation to the support mechanisms? That yes, do? there are different services available in different places, and there are sometimes different views taken and different uh, arrangements available in different local authority areas. And I think this is a particular issue where there's a question about uh, children um, under the terms of the, the bill, uh, who would be ages 16 and 17, and the circumstances that we have found some of the people who have identified at that age being put into uh, supported accommodation that isn't always entirely suitable. So anything that could strengthen those arrangements around about support would be extremely helpful. I do think it might be helpful to strengthen some of the arrangements around about presumption of age as well, where I think at the moment um, there is a proposal that uh, the presumption should be the age that's asserted by the victim. Um, my own view is that uh, if the victim is believed to be a child, then the, the presumption should be that they're a child as opposed to the age that they assert, which in our experience might be they assert that they're older than they actually are. Uh, and therefore we wouldn't want to go with a presumption that they weren't a child just because they said that they weren't. Uh, so that could be included specifically in the legislation as well, a point I was going to come to later. Okay, thank you Ms McKinnon, indeed. do you want to say anything about this, especially the children presumption? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in relation to children, I think we do have a very um, well-recognised child protection process for children under 16. I think ACC's Graham's point is, is important in terms of, of the age group of children between 16 and 18, where... Um, at times, our processes can come into conflict in terms of children's services and adult services and where those young people actually sit within the realm of, of service provision and support. But certainly for children under 16, we, we, we have, I think, as we say, fairly robust child protection processes which are mirrored across Scotland. They don't, they don't differ. Our processes are, are similar across Scotland in terms of managing young people who we believe to be at risk of uh, or have been are at risk of. To know their age, if you're seeing all... It's all yeah. hunky dory if you're yeah. 16 and under, but there has to be a there has to be a presumption. That people Absolutely, don't, like, there has to be a presumption in terms of, and some of the young people we do work with at the moment will say to us 
their age is older than we probably believe it to be for a number of reasons, um, some of which are about their own protection and, and fear of speaking out in terms of their age. So there is a, there is a real need to ensure um, that we are working with young people to try and secure and understand the age appropriateness of what it is they are saying. And at the moment, we do take the, the view that where we believe a child to be under 16, we will take the appropriate measures um, in terms of securing them in, in appropriate accommodation if that's necessary. But we do, have a, we do have a difficulty in terms of accommodation and supporting um, young people between 16 and 18. And sometimes the support and accommodation will vary significantly across Scotland and will not always be appropriate to the needs of the young person. So do we need to do something about this in this bill? I think, I think the bill needs to be very clear in terms of how we are defining a child in terms of a child up to 18, 18 and under, and ensuring that mm. that group of young people who can be very, very vulnerable are, are properly supported, identified, supported, and the appropriate service and provision put in place for them. Anybody else wish to? Mr Wolfe. Um, again, I go back to the directive, Article 13.2, Member States shall ensure that where the age of a person subject to trafficking in human beings is uncertain and there are reasons to believe the person is a child, that person is presumed to be a child in order to receive immediate access to assistance, support and protection in accordance with Articles 14 and 15. So as a jurisdiction we have an obligation to ensure that that presumption is applied and I, I notice that if one looks at the um, bill that's before the United Kingdom Parliament at Section 51, there's a presumption about age in that bill. Um, or the avoidance of doubt, child is 18 and under. Uh, under the directive, that's correct. Yes, yes. Um, right, does anybody else wish to come in on this, John? Thank you. I now have Elaine, followed by Alison. Elaine? Just to follow up on, on that line uh, of questioning, we've also heard evidence that there should be cross-referencing to the legislation which specifically applies to children in Scotland. And just to invite whether you think that would actually assist the bill if that, that, that happens. I think the bill itself doesn't really contain any specific information um, in terms of children and young people, and I think that, that clearly is an issue, that we do have legislative processes in place for children, the protection of children, and again, I think the bill would be enhanced if we had something which locates existing legislation within this process, that we can clearly define um, the processes that are in place and um, that we work with currently in terms of the protection of children, vulnerable children. Mr Wolfe. I could just add to that. Again, uh, um, if one goes to the directive, there are a series of provisions in relation to uh, children. Uh, these include provisions about the appointment of a guardian uh, and a series of provisions in relation to the way that uh, children will be treated in the course of investigation and um, uh, prosecution of trafficking uh, uh, offences. Um, now, it, it may be, it may be, that within our existing legislative regime um, and administrative practices, um, all of these mm -hmm. obligations on the directive are met. But um, the committee might wish to invite the Scottish Government, by way of good order, to identify for the committee precisely where the various obligations are met in the existing regime. Mm -hmm. Because one of the one of the problems, potential problems, if one's implementing a directive, um, one is entitled to rely on the, the general um, legislative regime in the country, but if one's relying on administrative practice, that may or may not be, be sufficient. Um, so uh, without um, uh, identifying any particular issue, th th it's, a, it's a fairly obvious gap when one looks at this bill against the directive. The directive contains a whole series of very detailed provisions about child victims, um, uh, which don't appear anywhere in the bill. And the committee perhaps needs to be confident that the Scottish Government has um, ticked the boxes in terms of making sure that all of these are, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, going to be in force in our uh, system. The presumption of age is a good example of one where one's already identified a potential gap in, yeah. in the enforcement. Yes, ACC, okay. It, it, it's a follow-on point from that. that I, I think it's true, um, and it's been recognised probably in previous evidence and in written responses, that the measures that are currently in place across Scotland probably do extend beyond what is uh, required under uh, current statute in some places. But I do think to have the opportunity, um, as is the intent of this bill, to place it into statute and therefore require 
that to take place as a safeguard that we should uh, be seeking to secure. Um, I, I don't think that it's a rationale to say, well, it's currently happening and therefore we don't need to legislate for it, um, because the whole premise of the bill is to focus attention on the issue of trafficking uh, in a way that uh, hitherto has not taken place with some of the disparate legislation and practices that are in place. And we did make a comment in relation to the securing of support and assistance uh, that we felt it could be strengthened even in relation to adults. Uh, and I would support the comments about um, specifying children, but in relation to adults where at section 8, uh, subsection 3, uh, the wording is that Scottish ministers may also secure provision of support and assistance. This is during the period when uh, competent authorities are looking to uh, assess if reasonable grounds uh, are met, uh, and, and we would recommend that the, the term must uh, should replace may also, um, because it doesn't give a particularly strong safeguard in the way that it's currently worded that that uh, support and assistance will be provided. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to indulge the, the committee uh, convener uh, about the benefits of that, because I, I suspect they've been um, well portrayed already, but from a law enforcement perspective, support and assistance is absolutely critical to get people's maintained uh, presence uh, and assistance in the criminal justice process. And uh, probably uh, more than nothing else, this is the thing that if we don't have in place uh, is a substantial barrier towards us getting more people through the court process. It must feel protected. Exactly. Yes. Elaine. Can I also um, ask you about uh, whether part two of the bill, whether or not there should be either a statutory defence uh, with regard to victims of uh, trafficking or a presumption of non-prosecution put on the face of the bill? <clears throat> um, because we've also had some evidence that suggests that that could mean that the victim would have to prove the link between the offence and the fact that they were trafficked. Um, so I just wondered what your views on that might be. Mr Wolfe. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, the starting point for this issue is um, Article 8, which requires member states to ensure that national authorities are entitled not to prosecute. Now, the background to that provision is that in some uh, member states of the Uni European Union, prosecutors are in effect obliged to prosecute if they find a crime. So that's the reason for the particular form of the article. And, and I accept immediately that um, the English courts at least have held that that article doesn't uh, impose an obligation on us to introduce a, a, a statutory uh, uh, defence. Um, that said, the principle of non-prosecution is well recognised. Um, and... The concern is that um, without a statutory defence, uh, prosecution or the protection for victims in this jurisdiction may be less than in the other parts of, of, of the UK. The, the English Bill and the Northern Irish Act both contain statutory uh, defences. Now, I, don't, I, I myself don't see those defences as being um, our substitute for sound prosecutorial discretion. The starting point must be um, the exercise of good judgment by the Lord Advocate and, and, and prosecutors. And I have great faith in the integrity of the uh, Lord Advocate and his uh, staff in the way they go about their uh, tasks. But um, if no one is infallible, and if one has a case that um, uh, whether Lord Advocate has or, or prosecutors have decided to prosecute um, and nevertheless the victim of, of, of trafficking is able to satisfy uh, uh, criteria which would have to be defined if one defined a statutory defence um, then um, uh, you know that, that, that defence would be there as a fail safe um, a fail safe for the uh, accused. Uh, it's fair to say that the starting point, if one's looking at a statute of defence, is a recognition that a crime has been committed by the victim of trafficking. And one does have to uh, apply one's mind to the nature of the relationship with the trafficking <coughs> yeah. conduct, which would justify a defence. But that's been found possible to do in the, two bi the, the Act in Northern Ireland and the Bill uh, in England. Um, and 
one of the advantages of the de defence is that it, uh, as I read it, um, would uh, allow an accused person to invoke the statutory defence in circumstances where one wouldn't be able to rely on a common law defence of necessity or coercion. They potentially go beyond that and therefore would provide additional protection to, uh, uh, to the victim. I Mr. suppose just, just one final point. No, no, point. it's very helpful. If, if, I, if I may, just the other respect in which at present the victim in Scotland is less well protected than in other parts of the UK is okay. that in um, England and Wales the court has the power uh, to exercise its own judgment as to whether the prosecutorial uh, decision was properly made. Right. And there have been cases uh, in, in the English courts where the English courts have ultimately quashed the conviction because the English court has taken the view that um, uh, in circumstances involving uh, trafficking, uh, the, the prosecution should not have been brought. Now, in Scotland, um, we have traditionally placed um, I I enormous uh, faith in the judgment of the prosecutor and the courts have historically in Scotland been very, um, uh, very slow to, to step in unless there's a very clear case uh, of oppression. So we're already in a position where in terms of the formal structures in place, the victim in Scotland may be less well protected against the possibility that the prosecutor May make, a, make, may make a misjudgment. But that's not in legislation south of the border, the intervention of the court. Perhaps. No, that, that's, the, that's the general, that, that's a, a difference in the general structure of the law in England and Wales. Yes, where, but, it's, yes but it's not in any it, trafficking bill. It's not in any trafficking no, bill. That's just what I'm getting at. But, but Clause 45 of the Modern Slavery Bill um, contains a specific defence. And I should say, both in the English Bill and Northern Irish Act, care has been taken not to apply the defence to every crime. It's recognised no. that um, um, to, 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 to apply the defence across the board would be um, going too far. Um, in the Northern Irish Bar Act, it's applied uh, only to uh, crimes which are uh, punishable uh, for uh, less than five years, with some exceptions. And the English Act approaches that in a slightly different way. But okay. in both acts, there, there, a way has been found to define uh, appropriately a defence. So I'm going to, Mr Mulgrew, then I'll take ACC Graham. Simply to pick up on the point that Mr uh, Wolf made uh, about the the abusive process plea that can be taken in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. the, the equivalent in Scotland would be what's called a plea in bar of trial, which can be yeah. taken where an accused person is able to assert that the prosecution against him would be oppressive. But it may be an opportunity within the bill to encapsulate, as well as uh, enshrining the prosecutorial discretion and the guidance that the Lord Advocate will publish uh, enshrining a, a statutory defence, also enshrining a plea and bar of trial on the basis that the person accused is okay. a, is a traffic, trafficking victim who has been compelled to commit this crime on the basis that he, he or she is a traffic victim. So it's maybe another point that the committee would wish to consider. Yeah. As a third. Braces, sort of. Yes, yes. Uh, uh -huh. and, and they are all mutually exclusive. The, yes. the Lord Advocate's discretion of statutory yes. defence and the plea in bar would afford the, the victim uh, extra, extra rights. Might also concentrate minds if they could have had a plea in bar of trial additionally. Yes, yes. because I, I do not question, as Mr Wolfe doesn't, the integrity of the Lord Advocate no, and his sad. team, but there are occasions when there is additional information yeah. which arises, as, the, as the committee have heard, sometimes the national referral mechanism can make mistakes. First responders go back to them, the Tara project go back and say, a mistake has been made in not identifying this person as a victim. Yeah. And so there might need to be those extra pleas available or defences yeah. available to a victim to ensure that their rights are protected. Might it also come out during the course of a trial something in the evidence that, you know, that wasn't there if we had a statutory defence? It yes. might come out during the course and it would be useful to have that. Yes, of course. Please. Thank you. ACC Graham, you wanted to... Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo the, the, the principle that we would want to uh, put everything in place that we could to ensure that we would avoid the circumstances where somebody was prosecuted for a crime that they had been uh, forced to commit through being trafficked. So you know, we all agree about that. I do think that there are some 
problems that have been highlighted with the statute of defence. And Mr Wolfe said that there are some exceptions in the Modern Slavery Bill. I think there are 130 offences that have been exempt uh, from the defence, and, and that in itself is problematic as to what they are uh, and how that would uh, potentially play out uh, in investigations and prosecutions. And from a police perspective in the investigation process, I go back to the question from Mr Finney uh, about what happens when you identify these people. Well, we do everything we can to gather as much information at the earliest opportunity and report that to the Crown so that a decision can be taken. And it might be that uh, in the early stages, before we've gathered all of that information, uh, we, we do um, identify that a crime has been committed, but we're very careful uh, about how we deal with that person, whether they're an accused person or whether they're a victim. And my expectation, based on our discussions with the Crown, is that there will be very clear instructions issued by the Lord Advocate uh, round about this particular issue, more so than uh, is the current position. And the practical experience of the last two years, particularly uh, since Police Scotland has been in existence, uh, caused us, because we were concerned about this issue, uh, to do a fairly comprehensive exercise in looking at were there any cases where, with what we know now, uh, in terms of our victim-centred approach to these issues and the learning um, that has emerged around about uh, victims of trafficking being forced into crim criminality. Are there any cases where we have uh, criminalised somebody and they have been convicted uh, and we couldn't find any through that exercise and we did it jointly with the Crown? So there wasn't any evidence to support that in the future uh, this measure would be required. Uh, I do think, additionally, uh, the focus of this legislation is to try and take away the onus of responsibility from victims to identify and to self-declare, because we understand that that is uh, a vulnerability in current structures and systems of the legal basis for any kind of prosecution or indeed for any action is based upon the foundation of a victim self-asserting that their circumstances are exploitative or that they've been trafficked, and yet the statute of defence would rely on that almost exclusively. So, for a number of reasons, I think there should be measures put in place to ensure uh, that uh, individuals are not criminalised where they've been coerced, but I'm not sure that the statute of defence is the best means of doing that. And I think robust instructions from the Lord Advocate uh, to the police uh, would very adequately deal with the circumstances. Okay. With a couple of points that ACC Graham raised there. Of course. The first is uh, he identified uh, Clause 45 of the Modern Slavery Bill and Schedule 4, which identifies a number of exceptions to the statute of defence. Section 22 of the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Act does it slightly differently and a lot, it puts it more shortly. So there, are, there is an example there where, where it can be achieved perhaps in uh, shorter terms. The other point that, that was raised is about the fact that there have been no examples identified in Scotland where persons who are trafficking victims have been convicted where there would have been a defence available to them. But the difficulty that, that we experience as practitioners is that even traffic victims do not identify to their solicitor that they are a trafficking no victim way. for a variety of reasons. And so if the measures of support, as are referred to in uh, Section 8 of the Bill, if they are fully implemented and uh, the EU Directive fully implemented, then it might have a, a, a beneficial effect in that victims are prepared to come forward and would assist the police in, in other prosecutions. I think we're also aware that even at the last gasp, people that we would identify as having been trafficked don't see they've been trafficked because the criteria by which they've measured their lives previously were so different from what we expect in our own society. Yes. Um, I've got Christian is on the same line or something different. Uh, no, I, I think ACC Graham uh, answered my Thank you very to... much. You're deleted. Yes, Margaret. Could, could I be clear? Here, um, ACC uh, Malcolm, are you in favour of future proofing? or having a provision for future proofing in, in the bill so that um, other forms of criminality exploitation that might not be looked at just now are, are covered? Yeah, <clears throat> I think we covered that in our written response, so we thought that would be helpful, actually, that uh, we thought it might be helpful to outline um, 
some of the, uh, the ways in which people could be exploited, but we understand that that is not exhaustive and indeed um, there will be means by which people will be exploited that perhaps we haven't yet thought of. And that should be on the face of the bill? I think it would be very helpful if the bill was sufficiently broad that it would enable um, future means of exploitation to be included within the various offences, yes. Okay. Okay. Alison. Um, I think we've dealt with statutory defence um, quite um, comprehensively. I note from the Law Society's um, written submission that you query the need to increase the maximum penalty from 14 years to life imprisonment, and you draw on evidence that um, four people convicted in Scotland in 2013, um, the custodial sentences for those convicted was just under two years. Um, and if you're querying it, do you want to elaborate on your concerns around about that? A sentence of life imprisonment would obviously give a court the widest sentence, sentencing powers available, but in light of the few prosecutions that there have been thus far and the penalty currently available of 14 years, um, the Society's view was that the, the Scottish criminal justice system could not be seen to be a soft touch to traffickers. So a, 14, a sentence of 14 years imprisonment is quite a significant penalty and isn't often uh, imposed by the courts in Scotland for the, even the gravest of offences that we deal with currently. Okay. Other panel members have any views on that? Apparently, no. No, no fine. Thank you. That you? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Roderick? Thank you. Um, if I may, I'd like to just change uh, the discussion to Section 8, um, to the... Uh, the provisions for support and assistance. Um, Mr. Wolf, you've referred in the faculty submission, or the faculty submission refers to that particular provision and suggests that uh, it doesn't go quite as far as uh, uh, various provisions in the consultation. Would you like to just expand on that view? Yes. Um, I suppose there's a prior point which has struck me uh, looking at Section 8. Um, which is that it imposes a, a, a duty on the Scottish ministers to secure for an adult who falls within the section the provision of such support and assistance as they consider necessary given the adult's needs. And I suppose that what that um, provision invites is a question about how in practice uh, this is going to be uh, implemented. Now, on the face of it, it's imposing our duty on Scottish ministers to apply their mind to the support and assistance which the particular adult needs and then to secure the provision of that support and assistance. And I just wonder whether that is really what is intended to happen on, on the ground. Is it actually intended that there will be an agency within or a, a group of um, officials within the Scottish Government itself who will be engaging in the exercise of uh, assessment of need and determination of the appropriate level of support and assistance and then ensuring that that is provided? Because that's what the provision says. Now, if that's not what's intended, then one would need to have a different provision, which would be providing the appropriate, placing the appropriate responsibilities on other agencies, local authorities, uh, 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 and others. Um, and if, if one's going to do that, then one might uh, wish to see uh, a mechanism within the bill which would secure that um, those other agencies were applying a consistent approach in the uh, nature of the support and assistance which they would be providing uh, across the piece. Thank you. Of course you can, yeah. yes, Oksana. Unless anybody else Very good to comment mood today. <laughs> yeah, no, just perhaps I can raise something that I don't think has been raised so far in the evidence session, which is again referred to in the faculty's written submission, which is the question of confiscation of property. Um, I take it from reading that submission, you thought that the potential provisions don't go far enough to protect a potential innocent uh, party who's 
property might be forfeited. Would you again care to expand on that? Yes. Um, the provisions in relation to detention and forfeiture are sections 9 and 10 of the bill. And um, I think there are two points of concern. One is um, in the context of detention, there's a power for the sheriff to release a vehicle, ship or aircraft on certain conditions, but only if satisfactory security is tendered. Now, the provision of security itself may be uh, financially burdensome. Um, and the concern is that there may be circumstances in which um, looking to the provisions of Section 10, um, forfeiture at the end of the day would never, never arise. And um, the concern is that uh, an owner is being put at that stage to uh, either having the vehicle, ship or aircraft uh, detained um, or, or if it's to be released, it's to be released only on the provision of security. Um, and the, it would be better if the sheriff were given a rather broader uh, power um, uh, to release, uh, release these items at that interim stage. At the stage of forfeiture, um, there's uh, uh, also a concern that um, there's the potential for the innocent uh, owner of, let's say, a ship that is being chartered to a trafficker or um, uh, a, 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 a small aircraft that's being chartered to a trafficker um, uh, may find their um, ship or their aircraft um, in effect confiscated or forfeited. Um, and there is a concern that that's going uh, further than would be appropriate. Are you concerned that it might have kind of uh, convention implications, or is that taking it too far? Um, one could readily see how an innocent owner um, uh, could um, could bring a convention rights uh, challenge to a situation where their uh, property has been taken away from them uh, without uh, without good reason. Thank you. I know if there's implications to the police in this. If, if you'd like to comment from your point of view. Yeah, I mean, per perhaps not surprisingly, we're uh, broadly supportive of uh, the, the intent behind this section. And, I mean, I think uh, it's comprehensively outlined in the legislation that uh, the circumstances when something's going to be confiscated and retained uh, need to be justified. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't see where the risk would be that uh, it would it would be wrongly taken from somebody or or retained uh, in circumstances that they were innocent. I think the legislation is designed to prevent that from happening. Uh, it probably goes back to the uh, question about sentencing from earlier, and I, I don't make any specific comment about individual sentences. But the, again, the intent of the legislation is to. Uh, provide a focus and demonstrate the intent uh, of Scotland as a nation to make uh, our country a difficult place for traffickers to operate in. Uh, and indeed, there has been some suggestion uh, in the past that some of the legislation and practice we currently have that Scotland could be a soft touch. Uh, so therefore, I think, uh, in, in, in line with the sentencing question, actually to explicitly state uh, that there could be a life sentence um, as a, uh, as a maximum penalty, uh, as a very clear message about how seriously we take this as a nation. And likewise, in terms of confiscation of property, uh, I think it's absolutely essential that we have a range of options by which we are able to tackle, uh, prevent and disrupt uh, traffickers from operating. Uh, and this is one well-recognised tool uh, in an armoury of uh, disruption and prevention has been able to prevent people from continuing by taking away that which will, uh, in some respects, cause them the most concern. Uh, and I think it's essential that these elements are retained, and they're retained in a way that can be worked. Uh, and we already have some significant challenges with uh, some of the uh, existing uh, means by which we can take assets and, and, and confiscate property from people. We have to work very, very hard 
and rightly so, to demonstrate that uh, anything is the proceeds of crime. Uh, and I think that this is entirely consistent with that legislation, so I would support it. Um, Gil? Can I raise a question with regards to the UK Anti-Slavery Commissioner? And we have a lot of evidence that uh, people are asking that why, why there's no reference to this uh, uh, post within the bill itself. My question is quite direct uh, to, to lawyers, uh, in fact, and I'm not entirely sure myself whether it's lawful for this parliament or the government to enact anything on the face of a bill since it's reser a reserve matter. So I wonder what your opinion was in that regard. I have to confess I have no particular view on the particular issue to do with the anti-slavery commissioner. It's not something I've applied my mind to. Um, if something uh, is a reserve matter, then um, uh, this parliament doesn't have power to uh, uh, pass legislation that relates to the reserve matter. Um, that doesn't prevent the parliament from uh, passing legislation which is incidental to non-reserved matters but which affects reserved matters and the line uh, can, can, can sometimes be uh, uh, not an easy one to uh, draw with precision. Um, but on, I'm afraid I haven't looked at the specific question of the anti-slavery commissioner. Uh, are, you are you suggesting that maybe not in the face of the bill, but maybe in guidance, would, would, would that be competent? Would well, I think the, the prior question is whether the anti-slavery commissioner is a reserved matter, and I, that's not something I've applied my mind to. I see. Okay. Um, Thanks very much. <coughs> Thank you for your evidence. Okay. I'm going to suspend for Let's just a couple of minutes to allow witnesses to change over. It's a long haul. Thank you very much. 
Uh, welcome our third panel of witnesses, Lord Advocate Right Honourable Frank Mulholland QC, Kathleen Harper, National Sexual Crimes Unit at the Crown Office and Prosecutor Fiscal Service, and Katrina Dalrymple, Head of Policy Division at uh, COPFIS as well. So I think you've all been here before, and uh, I think you've been here before, Ms Harper, as well. I, I, I haven't, no. You haven't? No. It's exciting for you. <laughs> We're very gentle. Um, and uh, your microphone will come on automatically when I call you and if you have anything to say about something. And I'll go straight to questions, please. And let's see who didn't get in first and last. Elaine, then I'll take Christian. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I just wanted to go back to the issue about uh, part two and whether or not there should be a statutory defence or presumption of non-prosecution actually on the face of the bill or whether, Lord Advocate, it should be left to guidance from yourself. Uh, we had uh, contradictory evidence, I think, in the previous session between the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society and Police Scotland, uh, which I don't know whether you've managed to, to catch, but um, basically the Faculty of Advocates and uh, the Law Society were in favour of it being on the bill. The police were, were less keen on that idea. So I invite your, your views on that. OK, thank you. Um, I think uh, that if you put a statutory defence in the face of the bill, it will lead to more injustices uh, than is myself as Lord Advocate issuing instructions. Um, firstly, we would take our lead from Parliament as to what the extent of uh, a defence uh, is if, you, if it is to, to be placed uh, on the face of the bill. Um, you know that the dynamics of human trafficking, um, I'm sure you've received a lot of evidence, led a, read a lot of information on that. Often it's the case that victims of human trafficking don't know that they're victims of human trafficking. Uh, it, it may be that um, they have a fear of authority from their own country. That can include solicitors. Uh, a statutory defence places the onus uh, on the... Um, accused to raise a defence uh, and in order for that defence to be considered by a jury there has to be an evidential basis for it. There is no burden of proof uh, on an accused person but they have an onus on them to raise it and for certain evidence to, or, or the defence to be rooted in evidence uh, before it can be considered uh, by uh, the jury itself. If you look at the Northern Irish uh, and uh, English and Welsh legislation, the, and indeed the directive, we talk about compulsion. We have the common law offence of coercion, which is very narrow. Um, I don't think that this really fits the territory uh, that we're in. When I talked about it having an evidential basis in order to, for it to be considered uh, by the jury, Come back to the point I made that often victims of human trafficking don't know they're victims of human trafficking. They have a social bond, an economic bond with the trafficker. Uh, and it, it seems to me that instructions issued by me to prosecutors and the police uh, will capture a lot more uh, than a statutory defence in the face of the bill. Let me explain. Uh, just now, uh, on the basis of the approach that we currently take, um, in relation to victims of human trafficking. We can um, deal with intelligence or information from organisations that uh, support victims in the field, such as Tara. We have had um, cases, um, I know of certainly one case uh, involving um, cannabis farms, uh, where information came to us uh, in the middle of the trial, um, and it was based primarily on intelligence uh, that was received uh, and uh, given to us. Um, our procedures to ensure a consistency of approach uh, is that it will be investigated because it's very important there's got to be a credibility uh, for victims of human trafficking. It's an easy thing to say that I'm a victim of human trafficking when you're charged with a, a serious offence, so it has to be properly investigated. But if there's credible evidence or if there's credible intelligence, uh, it will go to um, Kath Harper, who's the head of the National Sexual Crimes uh, Unit on my left, to then take a decision on what to do. And we have abandoned um, pros prosecutions 
on the basis uh, of that, uh, on the basis of intelligence, uh, and we'll continue to do that in the future. Now, there's also problems in relation to statutory defences. Statutory defence on the basis of the principle of fair notice. Um, the Crown has to receive um, notice of what the defence is. Normally, in criminal procedure, that has to be done uh, a certain amount of days in advance of the commencement of a trial, uh, ranging from, I think, 10 till uh, two days, depending on what the defence is. There is exceptional circumstances where the court can admit it during the currency uh, of the trial uh, itself. But again, a statutory defence, you know, the point I'm making uh, is that it would apply to the criminal proceedings and would, in general terms, have to be made known, lodged in advance of the commencement of the trial. Now, human trafficking uh, doesn't necessarily follow this kind of rigid procedural structure. Uh, and we have had cases, in fact, uh, without going into details, uh, we are currently considering uh, a case of shoplifting for three uh, individual, uh, three persons, who have been convicted of shoplifting. And the information, in fact, intelligence, uh, only came after conviction and sentence. And again, that's something which a statutory defence wouldn't cover. Uh, and uh, if we have the, the necessary means to be able to um, apply to the court if the information is credible uh, for the court to then set aside the conviction. So I think a much more flexible approach uh, where the Lord Advocate issues instructions, not guidance, instructions to our prosecutors uh, and to police uh, and allows the agencies, NGOs in the field working with victims to have this channel of communication with the Crown is far more productive uh, and will lead to fewer injustices than perhaps a rigid statutory defence on the face of the bill. So, uh, in my view, I think it's much better uh, to do this by Lord Advocate's instructions, which prosecutors and Chief Constable are obliged to follow. Can I just say that the, um, section, section 7 says guidelines rather than instructions. Should that be amended to...? Well, I, that's a very good point. Uh, I, the three of us gave evidence to the cross-party group on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that was made there wa uh, was the distinction between guidelines and instructions. Mm -hmm. So I reflected uh, on this. Uh, I think it was Kirsty Thompson of the LSLA who raised the point. Uh, and my view is that uh, these would be much better as instructions as opposed to, to guidelines. I think the point was made, well, guidelines are guidelines. Uh, they, 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 they're not instructions that you have to do something. And it seemed to me that in this field, it'd be much better for it, it to be instructions. Now, what, what I've done is my, my practice as Lord Advocate, uh, where um, on the face of a bill, uh, I'm required to issue uh, guidelines or instructions. My practice has been to publish draft guidelines uh, during the passage of the bill. Um, we signed them off yesterday, so what I can do is I can, uh, Chair, send them to you. Uh, I'll also have them published in SPICE, uh, and we've sent them to uh, all, many uh, of uh, the groups who work with victims and deal with human trafficking in the field including uh, the Commissioner uh, for the UK, uh, including the head of Europol, uh, uh, including Tara and various organisations. And I make the point that if you have any concerns or any suggestions to, to make the instructions more focused, please let me know um, before we, I finally sign them off uh, and issue them to uh, prosecutors and chief, the Chief Constable. Yeah, just one uh, issue that came up in the previous session that was suggested that in the UK courts and in Northern Ireland there was a process by which the court could quash a, uh, a prosecution if, if certain things came to light during the... During the yeah, I, I, but the implication from what James Wolfe was was that this didn't exist within the Scottish system. I don't think that's right. Yeah. Uh, in the mm. Scotland Act, the Lord Advocate is uh, required to comply with EU law. Uh, I'm required to comply with uh, the Scotland Act so, and, and the Human Rights Act. So I cannot uh, act ultra virus of that. So um, if, uh, for example, it was said that I was prosecuting a victim of human trafficking, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, then it's open to the defence to raise a, what's called a compatibility issue, to say that I'm acting incompatible with EU law. Mm -hmm. There's also the common law plea and bar of trial on the grounds of yeah. oppression. That's some, so, I mean, there's plenty of uh, avenues of challenge within uh, criminal procedure in Scotland for this to be raised. And, of course, there's also the issue of uh, judicial review as well mm -hmm. uh, on the decision-making. But, look, I, I make a public statement, as I've made at the cross-party group and at the Human Trafficking uh, Summit in October of last year, I uh, will not prosecute a victim of human trafficking uh, that's, well, that's not what we're, we're about. But look, you have to, I'm sure you're all aware, understand the dynamics uh, of human trafficking between uh, the trafficker and the person trafficked. And it's not, uh, it's not a black and white issue in many cases. I think, Lord Advocate, we have accepted got, and that, that, and that yeah. the, the status of someone from having not thinking of traffic to being traffic, maybe something they never even recognised themselves practically at some point. Uh, so I think we understand the complexities and I, I think it's very useful for you to have gone through the, the discretion mm -hmm. and the, the wide range of um, discretion that is used by you as public prosecutor in Scotland. Um, it, it's been very helpful to, to, to let us contrast uh, putting in a statue. I mean, I don't think we've come to any view in it, but it's certainly been very helpful. Yeah, I think, I think that explanation. One, one of the issues, of course, is that you may make a statement that you would never do it, but the legislation has to be strong enough that if a future Lord Advocate took a different view or, or whatever, that the legislation has yes. to be strong enough. Well, I, I thought about that point, and I, and I was reflecting um, on previous Lord Advocates and my time as Lord Advocate. Uh, uh, there is a continuity, and I, I, I can't think of any uh, occasion where I have rescinded previous Lord Advocate's sort of guidance or instructions. Uh, we may sort of strengthen them, we may sort of finesse them, but um, I, I would think that future Lord Advocates, um, you know, to issue instructions that victims of human trafficking should be prosecuted. Uh, one, it would be ultra-virus of uh, the, the European Union Directive in any event, but Secondly, uh, I don't think that uh, they would act in, in such an unethical way. Yeah. Yeah. On the same, yeah. I was just thinking, even for example, in the, I think, circumstance which none of us here would particularly want, where we came out of the European Convention of Human Rights and had a, a British human rights law instead, is, you know, is, is, would that affect? Well, that would be different because that's a human I rights act. Into political arenas here, Elaine. Yeah. Uh, can I can I say I've got supplementaries on this line from Margaret, Roderick, and John. So, uh, and Alison, are you on the same thing? Are you on the statutory defence? Well, Alison was first, so you're first, Alison. I didn't know it was in the same question. All right, no. And then I've got supplementaries on this whole issue, Margaret, Roderick, and John. After Alison. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, just to press you further, Lord Advocate. I mean, and I absolutely um, appreciate your commitment that you've, you've you've made this morning in relation to instructions. But the LSE and, and previous um, evidence um, session made it quite clear that they didn't think the non-prosecution um, procedure and the statutory defence were mutually exclusive and that there was an extra um, safeguard there for people who slipped through the, the net sort of thing. How do you react to that? Well, it goes back to the initial point. I take my lead from Parliament. Uh, and if you say that uh, the way in which the European Union directive has to be implemented was a, a defence, and it seems to me that that, that is your choice and I implement it uh, in that way. Um, should I go wider than that? Uh, if I went wider than that in the guidelines, would I be uh, taking a different view from Parliament? Because you've considered the matter and you've said that um, the, um, st the statutory defence is a way in which they discharge the EU obligations. So it seems to me there would be a sort of tension between so, both. So you're saying they are exclusive? You well, couldn't have a, a requirement for non-prosecution but also statutory defence. You see, those are contradictory. Well, uh, I think, uh, in essence, yes, they are, because okay. what I'd be okay. saying is that I take my lead from, from Parliament because you have considered that you as the Parliament, and this is a way in which you uh, have discharged the European Union Directive obligation, sought the, to discharge the, it. The defence of statutory... The statutory defence is in the English and the Northern Ireland bills, 
Um, are there no guidelines then round about non-prosecution in either of these jurisdictions? Uh, I'm not aware of guidance yet. There may be guidance that may, uh, will be issued uh, by prosecutors in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. I should add that there's a huge carve-out in relation to statutory defence in uh, Northern Ireland, England and Wales. Uh, it doesn't apply to many, many offences. I think uh, 130 was um, previous... Uh, yeah contributor to the Justice okay. Committee, whereas my, my guidelines would apply across the board. And of course, this talks about a statutory defence. Often, um, without going into de you know, the, the details of uh, human trafficking, but often you only find out there are victims of human trafficking uh, at the end or beyond the criminal justice process. Uh, and that doesn't fit very well with a statutory defence. Well, it doesn't fit at all with a statutary defence. Okay, that's helpful. I could take Roderick, then I'll take uh, Margaret, and then I've got John. Representative from the Law Society in the previous panel, he talked about a plea and bar of trial uh, with common law um, defence. I wasn't sure whether he was suggesting that that be put in a statutory framework, but uh, would you like to comment on that, Jim? But uh, yeah. existing common law, then you wouldn't need to yeah. put it in the statutory yeah. framework uh, because it exists yeah. in any event. But a, a plea and bar of trial on the grounds of oppression, there are very high tests that you have to meet to be able to establish it. Uh, and, of course, uh, you have to evidence it. Uh, it's got to be rooted in evidence before you can make that plea to the court. My point is that when you're dealing with Lord Advocate's instructions, you can take account of information, uh, take account of intelligence, because, you know, in this world... Um, that um, there is a lot of intelligence which you wouldn't be able to evidence uh, and it might not be in the interests of the victim of human trafficking uh, to be able to um, give law enforcement that evidence uh, itself. So I think it's much better uh, for me to issue instructions and to have in place a framework uh, where we can take account of intelligence information from a wide range of, of bodies uh, to be able to do justice. Come back to my sort of principal point that is, uh, we're not about prosecuting the victim of human trafficking. Margaret? Yeah, I think, I think the point was, and, and taking on board totally what you say about the flexibility, and, and that sounds very good, but I think the point was made that, albeit in a very small set of circumstances, this might be another useful tool in the box. Um, well, I've heard the argument. Uh, I don't think it is because I think it would be far too narrow um, and I think a much more flexible, holistic, inclusive approach working across uh, all the agencies and um, people involved in combating human trafficking is much more important and much more productive of delivering justice, which is, is what we're about. So. Uh, that's, that's where I come on that. I don't know from Kathleen Harper, the senior Crown Counsel, head of NSEU, who's been taking these decisions. I don't know, Ka Kathleen, if you want to, to maybe comment on the, the work that goes into um, these decisions. From my perspective, the Lord Advocate's instructions provide something that's very effective and, and flexible, as, as uh, the Lord Advocate has said. Cases come to me as the lead prosecutor for human trafficking as head of the National Sexual Crimes Unit. And cases coming to me as a single point of contact perhaps gives confidence both externally and internally uh, within the organisation that a consistent approach will be taken to these cases. And that's married up to the raising of awareness within the department of what to look for, the factors to look for, the signs to look for. And so those in COPFS who are dealing with case, the potential cases are aware of reading the signs necessary. So they, the cases all come to me as a one point of contact, which I think allows for a very effective approach. Um, it's also very flexible because, as, as the Lord Advocate has said, we will be looking at uh, all manner of information, intelligence, 
all sorts of advice uh, from the UK Human Trafficking Centre, from Migrant Help, from other organisations, and we'll look at all intelligence and all information, so there's a wide-ranging approach which allows a very uh, flexible approach, and that approach lasts throughout the, the life of the case and beyond. And even if there is a conviction, then we can look at that and, and apply to the courts retrospectively to have the conviction set aside. So uh, it's a very flexible and effective tool in the form of the Lord Advocate's instructions. I suppose there would be a lot about awareness raising there. Um, if someone is, realises that they're not considered to be a victim of trafficking and therefore they don't have any defence, then to have a statutory uh, defence option open to them is easily um, understood by them. Whereas, you know, they're going back to the same people who have said, we don't consider you um, a victim of, of trafficking. Is there not some problematic um, or problems with, with that attitude? Albeit, you know, we accept what you're saying, it's not in your interest to, to prosecute them, you want to be open, but you will still be seen as the, the body that thought they were not victims of trafficking and... Yeah, is that not problematic? The fact that a person doesn't realise themselves that they're a victim of trafficking it is going to be a problem for anybody dealing with this sort of uh, issue. It would be the same for, for Defence Council, for instance. It's the fact that you don't recognise them as a victim of trafficking. There's nowhere to go then in, in saying it wasn't uh, criminal behaviour because you, know, you were complicit. But uh, again, we are going to be taking into account all the information that's available and taking up and there is a very strong presumption against prosecuting Henry if they are seen as a credible or possible credible victim of, of human trafficking so a very wide ranging approach will be taken I think you know the, the point is uh, what if you get it wrong uh, or what if you don't read the signs properly that's where we're coming from well firstly uh, their instructions uh, secondly um, I cannot, act compatible, I cannot act in contravention of EU law. This is a directive from the European Union, so it leaves me wide open to a compatibility issue which can be raised uh, before the court. And thirdly, I'm subject to judicial review uh, for my decisions, and when I say my decisions, but also prosecutors that act on my behalf and on my instructions. So what you have is locks, uh, avenues by which uh, if... You know, I'm willfully blind on the issue. I can be challenged through the courts, and the courts have superintendence uh, of my decision making. I don't think it's willful blindness that's the the, the point. It's you know, the intelligence may not have reached you, and perhaps. Well, I, look, I, look, I do that, that's, that's, take the point. Is it? Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, if intelligence has not reached me, the intelligence may not reach the defence at all, uh, and it may be that. Um, there is no statutory defence, yet someone is a victim of human trafficking. The, one of the issues with a statutory defence is it places a focus on the victim to raise it, to raise it with the lawyer uh, and to uh, lodge the defence with the court. Now, I understand the ethos or the underlying ethos for the European Union Directive is that, uh, that we're taking a holistic approach to this. Uh, and it's not just uh, the victim who re requires to be able to raise the issue uh, with uh, law enforcement. They may not want to do it, but there's other avenues in my instructions uh, whereby the issue could be raised uh, out with the victim themselves or the alleged victim themselves. Yes, Mr. Andrew. I was just going to add that I think the examples where proceedings have been discontinued the information about the victim being human trafficked was not from the victim themselves. I think in one situation it was actually from the LSA um, and um, other agencies that provided that information to the Crown um, who undertook further investigations. And then obviously that was reported to the head of NSCU. Uh, and we're currently, um, without revealing uh, too much detail in public, we're currently considering um, persons who've been convicted of shoplifting. Uh, as to whether, as part of um, being victims of human trafficking, they were required to shoplift on behalf of the traffickers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this information, which we're checking out, only came 
um, post-conviction and sentence. And in fact, uh, the persons um, uh, who were convicted and sentenced for shoplifting, some of them have returned to their country of origin. So notwithstanding that, um, we feel that we have a duty to, to look objectively uh, at this. Um, and if uh, at the end of this process uh, there is credible evidence or credible information, because I don't just think it should be restricted to evidence, that they are victims of human trafficking. So notwithstanding that some of uh, the persons don't live in the country, will apply to the court to set aside the conviction. And I suppose the benefit of that is that there are no time limits for the Lord Advocate's instructions. Mm -hmm. um, that throughout the whole life of a the case, these instructions will apply. I've got a few, couple of members who want to come in. If you, if you could maybe even join your questions, because I think this is a very important, but very, uh, very important debate about. I've got John and Alison both wanting to ask on the same thing. I take it Thank on the issue of a statutory defence. Thank you, Kavina. Yeah. Have you anything some new to ask? Well, I've been. Mean, Trying to frame a question for the Lord of Advocacy, he's made a very compelling case for, yes. for your instructions, Lord Advocate. And I suppose my question is about when do you stop being a victim you've, you've, <clears throat> of human trafficking? If someone were to remain, for instance, in the UK, um, because there must come a tipping point where if you want to go, you know, OK, they were a victim, they're now a resident of the UK. It, it's not a get-out-of-jail-for-life free card. So I would have thought perhaps you would have wanted to put the onus back onto the individual to prove their position. Or when do you stop being a victim, perhaps, is the, the question. Well, in, in relation to the European <clears throat> Union Directive, um, what we'd look at is uh, whether you were a victim of human trafficking at the time of the commission of the offence, which is, is the point. It may be that the world has moved on. Uh, and that uh, they've been integrated into uh, society and no longer a victim of human trafficking. And, of course, if the, at that stage uh, he or she committed an offence, of course, they wouldn't have the victim of human trafficking defence open to them because they wouldn't be a victim of human trafficking at the time they committed the, the crime. I, I know you were restricted in what you could say about the shoplifting, but... <coughs> Excuse me. It's a very pernicious crime, human trafficking, and it has a. The influences can be long-lasting. Are you able to give an assurance then that there will always be a consideration given um, to see if there has been an element of coercion when someone has been involved in that crime, if uh, they've previously been a victim of human trafficking? At all, you know, this this uh, instruction will persist for all time coming. For example, if we get, get credible information ten years on. Uh, that the person convicted was a victim of human trafficking will still look at it. Thank so you. it Thank will you, pers persist uh, in the future. Alison. A couple of points. If, if a case is set aside <coughs> following further information, would the assistance and support that a victim of trafficking would have expected, had they been identified earlier, be applied sort of later in the process? I, I, it's probably best directing that to the agencies yeah. involved, but... I, I, I would be astonished if it, if it wouldn't. But would you have a kind of referral mechanism? Oh, yes, sure yes. That that, yeah, that, that, yeah. And, and a question from Ms. Dalrymple. Are you able, and is it appropriate, for you to tell us how many cases in the last year have, have not been prosecuted? Um, in terms it might help, of, it might help I'm, I'm sure um, we have six individuals that, is that right, Kath? Yes. Six individuals where we've taken a decision not to prosecute okay. or discontinue or... Yeah. Um, set aside a conviction. Okay. And we've had one individual that was referred to um, Kath, but actually once all the investigation was done with all the different agencies, it became apparent that that individual was not what we deemed to be a, a credible victim of human trafficking and that prosecution continued. That so it shows that the, the test is, is applied. Well, yeah. There's very good um, uh, information out there from the Inter International Labour Office from the uh, EU Commissioner, uh, Anti-Trafficking Commissioner, as to the signs uh, uh, and what you would consider when you're reaching your, your judgment. And prosecutors are being trained uh, in this area. For example, um, Bruna uh, spoke at uh, the Crown Council uh, annual uh, weekend conference on human trafficking, which was um, you know, very well received. Um, so it's very important that you know, there's an ongoing commitment uh, to train our, our prosecutors uh, on 
um, any developments, uh, any changes in the dynamic of human trafficking, so that they have most up-to-date uh, information available. Thank you. Christian? I want to keep away from prosecuting victims and going to prosecuting people who are uh, uh, trafficking, who are, who are offenders. And I would like to know from you what exactly we are at. You know, in the past, did we have had difficulties uh, to prosecute? And will the provisions in this bill will help increase the number of prosecutions? Um, I think, I think it... it it will. it will certainly help because it consolidates, uh, you know, the field, which is very disparate uh, currently in, in relation to the legislation uh, that applies. Uh, it also uh, makes um, strengthens our hand in relation to proceeds of crime, making it a lifestyle offence. And uh, there's prevention orders there. There's the aggravation in relation to human trafficking. And I think uh, make the obvious point that. You may not be able to prosecute on the evidence available for a human trafficking offence, but what you can do is uh, there are uh, sort of ancillary offences such as fraud, uh, such as um, uh, immigration offences, uh, such as um, ro keeping or running a brothel, uh, all these types of offences that we have used in the past. Uh, and in order to put it in proper context, the bill includes the... Uh, the recommendation which is made by uh, Baroness Kennedy, I think the Human Rights Commission, that there should be um, an aggravation uh, which can be applied to the non-human trafficking offences but are part of the landscape. So again, going back to your point, I think this will strengthen the hand, uh, hands of law enforcement in relation to the prosecution of human trafficking. W it's, it's often, there are challenges, there's no point in, in, in hiding this, there are challenges in relation to prosecuting human trafficking. Available, availability of witnesses is a huge uh, issue in relation to the prosecution of these cases. Often you find that the key witnesses uh, just sort of disappear and go elsewhere. Uh, so we're well aware of that. Um, we have had uh, successes in relation to uh, convictions for human trafficking. Um, we've had um, uh, convictions uh, for uh, economic exploitation, human trafficking. Um, Craig and Buchan, uh, where uh, sexual exploitation. Uh, we've had uh, proceeds of or confiscation orders uh, applied. Uh, Nimber was uh, convicted of trafficking and prosti uh, prostitution. All three of them received pretty significant sentences of imprisonment. Uh, we've strengthened the links with Europol uh, and uh, with the UK Commissioner, Anti-Trafficking Commissioner. We've got very good links with the European Union Anti-Trafficking Commissioner who visited the Parliament and met with her. Uh, and uh, we've, I think, as heads of prosecution across the common law, um, a meeting two years uh, ago to discuss uh, human trafficking. Of course, very importantly, there was a human trafficking summit. Uh, you know, I see this as not just a Scottish problem. I think we all agree on that. Um, there's no point in uh, us sort of driving human trafficking south. We've all got an interest in dealing with it across the UK and beyond. And that's why at the summit, um, we had the Jim Wallace, the Advocate General for the UK, the DPP England and Wales, the DPP Northern Ireland, and the DPP for the Republic of Ireland, together with a European Union input. And we're working from the commitments which was made in the summit. Uh, within a year's time, we'll, we'll drill down into you know, what we're actually uh, committed to do working together. So hopefully, uh, this will make the United Kingdom um, and Ireland uh, a bad place to do this type of business. So, yeah, I might add into this, but we, we receive a lot of evidence about the uh, inabilities of the national referral mechanism uh, to address a lot of these issues. Uh, do you think that the bill is very much limited uh, into identifying that uh, trafficking, you know, this, this, offen this offences took place, and uh, the national referral mechanism is not um, is not helping, and uh, that in the strategy, which is uh, in the provision of the bills, 
uh, should maybe advance a lot more of its problems and therefore uh, solution and increase the number of prosecution that you would, we would all like to see. Well, uh, the, the national refer referral mechanism, I think, is a valuable tool uh, to be able uh, to identify victims of human trafficking. But it's, uh, compared to the point I make, it's often not black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, and a recent prosecution, Kolova, in Scotland, uh, we had um, victims uh, who were coming here for a better life economically. They'd been promised a job. Uh, they contacted the traffickers through the internet and they arrive at Glasgow Airport believing that, you know, they're going to a job and what then happens is there's a kind of grooming dependency which is built up with the traffickers and then they're introduced uh, to men that they might want to meet and get to know better. Uh, and they're in a very difficult situation because the trafficker has taken all their documents uh, for safekeeping, um, as it was said to them. So uh, my, my point is that what you need is you need a huge matrix uh, of uh, many organisations in the field, which I think we've got. I'm not saying it's perfect. We can always improve things. But going back to my instructions, what we need to do is to be able to take information from all the players in the field and be able to act on it. Uh, and I, that's what I think would be the best way in which to combat human trafficking uh, in Scotland and the United Kingdom. All well, the players in the field who came in, in front of this committee said they wanted to have some ch children provision in, in the face of the bill. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, I can see the arguments in favour of that. I think uh, the approach that's been taken by the Scottish Government, and I'm here as Lord Advocate, not, I wasn't involved in the drafting uh, of the bill, but uh, I think the approach was, was taken was to have a, a fence which applies across the board regardless of age. The one, one aspect of it that um, I did give some consideration to is the presumption of age. Um, that, I think, on balance may be helpful to have uh, in, in the bill, um, and I, I, because we know that uh, there are occasions where there is some dubiety about the age of the victim or victims, uh, and uh, I think it's just a general requirement that if you suspect that a, a victim of human trafficking is a child, uh, then in, in, until um, you know, you have definitive confirmation of what the position is. It should be treated as a child. I think that's common sense. We'd all want to do that. If, if it's not in the face of the bill, uh, what I can do, and um, we've already discussed it, is I can include it in the instructions. Uh, so that's another uh, means of, of dealing with it. So um, I don't know if that sort of answers your question. Um, but uh, if it was in the face of the bill, um, you know, I wouldn't be upset about it. If it's not in the face of the bill, if that's your decision, then I would certainly include it in the instructions. Will you add new instructions uh, as the same, on the same principle, people with learning, uh, learning difficulties, people with disabilities? Well, I mean, I mean, I need to look at it, obviously, but um, um, you, there comes a point where there are far too many sort of classes uh, of victim, um, which perhaps is a bad thing. Uh, it would just depend on, you know, what the issue is. Is there an issue in relation to persons with learning difficulties? If I could say there's, there's one thing that can... I know this is not an answer to your question, but the consent um, is uh, not a defence in Clause 1 of the bill, and I notice it's not in Clause 4. I'd, li I'd like it in Clause 4, um, because if you... S on the principles of statutory construction interpretation, the way the courts would look at this is say, well, Parliament's taken the view that it should be mentioned, it should be provided for in Clause 1. So therefore, Parliament has taken the view that uh, it shouldn't be provided for in Clause 4, so therefore you require consent in relation to Clause 4. So I think that's a danger in relation to statutory construction. So I hope that's, that's helpful. Thank you.
Margaret's brief. It's just on the, the definition, there's been widespread concern about the use of the word travel. Do you think it could um, benefit from further clarification to ensure that it was spelt out this includes within as opposed to between countries? This is the, the international uh, okay. issue that's been raised. I don't think it's a problem with the definition in the bill. I checked last night the Oxford Short Dictionary as to what the definition in the Oxford Short of travel is, and it's the move from one place to another. So there's no sort of international uh, sort of injection of internationalism within that definition. It doesn't have to be moved, surely, because we had evidence that somebody could be held in a flat and traffic within the flat. Yes. There's no travel involved. Well, I think that's clear from the way in which um, Clause 1 is drafted. A person commits an offence if the person arranges or facilitates another person's travel. Now, what does that mean? The way the courts will, uh, will uh, construct or, or interpret that <coughs> is to look at the rest of the section. OK. Because including in particular Exchange by... Exchange control. Yeah. So you've got... Uh, Roman numeral one, recruiting the person with a view to transporting or transferring the person. That could okay. include someone in a flat. Transporting or transferring the person. Transferring or exchanging control of the person goes back to the chair's point yeah. that that could be included by that uh, subhead. And also harbouring or receiving the person, which again... Uh, so the definition of travel, is, to, to my mind, doesn't include or doesn't require an international country-to-country -country It's element. perhaps just where it appears in the clause, in that the first word that hits you is arranges of another person's travel, the emphasis perhaps, rather than the substantive when we look at all the other subsections. Well, so it's, it's, it's a word it's including in particular by and then gives four examples. So that's the way that the court will interpret <coughs> this. Okay. So say, what does travel mean? Well, what, what, what did Parliament intend? Well, look at one, two, three and four. And you can see the clear intention of Parliament. So it's not restricted to movement from one country to another or one place to another. It, it, it's much more expansive than that. I suppose the point was, given there's been such concern raised by so many witnesses, wouldn't it be better just to belt and brace and clarify the word travel to make sure, spell out, it means within? It well, makes that, for better legislation, really. Well, I see that argument. My, my view is that on strict canons of statutory construction, it's unnecessary. But it's an and. I'm just looking. It, you've given the examples, the subsection 1A, and then the four uh, subclauses following that, and arranges and facilitates that travel. So it's not just those things happen, and arranges or facilitates that travel. Well, what you could do, I, I think suppose... think it's a bit... It's not as clear... Well, well, I mean, that's a matter for Parliament. You could take the view that Anne's unnecessary there. Or, uh, but what I think you would need to yes. do is you would need to hear from the parliamentary draftsman or the sponsoring government minister as we to will. what is meant by but that. But you can see why it, it seems to facilitate, seems to be linked and always to the idea of travel. Mm -hmm. And as but a prosecuting will... body, then, obviously, that must yep. be of concern to you, I would have thought. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, um, with very limited time to, to, to reach a view. But, uh, you know, if I'm arguing, I'm defending this uh, in a court, um, I wouldn't think this was in any way flawed. I, th I think okay. the tension of Parliament would be clear. Uh, can, I, can I, I'm going to uh, finish there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you've given us food for thought about the statutory defence. Um, if I'm ever in trouble and you're not the, fact, the, the Lord Advocate anymore, will you defend me, please? <laughs> so it's a good argument put there. Thank you very much. And uh, we're now moving into private session.